Perhaps it's timely to recognize that the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War is this coming Sunday, March 19th. And joining us now to discuss is John Burns, an Iraq War veteran and the Deputy Director of Concerned Veterans for America. John, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for your services. Uh, thanks for having me on, Kara. Always good to be on with you. Great. So given that your, your service, your experiences, do you sit back and watch this war in Eastern Europe playing out over this last well over a year now and think to yourself, wow, we're making some of the same mistakes over again? I certainly do. Um, you know, there's a huge concern with escalation. The, what happened over the weekend or, or this past week, the last few hours with the with the drone uh, is just, you know, proof that escalation can happen at any time, that we have to be very, very careful in this situation. Uh, and I think about the fact, you know, I, I deployed to Iraq 19 years ago, uh, was mobilized 20 years ago, but deployed 19 years ago. And I now have uh, three three nieces, all of whom are of the age to serve in the military. And it's just incredible to think that they could end up going to a place like like Ukraine or, or going to Iraq or, or, you know, some other place in the world uh, w without a lot of thought being put into it, just being kind of slow walked into a war. Um, you know, again, again, similarly to to 20 years ago, you know, it's very, very hard for the general news consumer to sift through the truth uh, and the, the falsehoods that are out there. And I want to talk about your experiences serving abroad. So 9-11 uh, happens. I believe you're in New York City when it does happen. You're there at Ground Zero in the weeks afterward, helping in the aftermath of the terrorist attack. And as you say, uh, you later do ship out to Iraq. Can you talk to us about some of those experiences you had during 9-11, after 9-11, and talk to us also about what it was like shipping out to Iraq, deploying out there. Sure. It, it was, a, it was you know, it was a shocking day. I, I remember it clearly, and I will for the rest of my life. Uh, beautiful September morning, late summer morning, uh, walking outside in the morning, the sun's out, it's getting warm. Uh, going to a class, I was a student at Hunter College in uh, up, uptown Manhattan, uh, sitting down, hearing sirens outside the window, and hearing a few minutes later that a plane had hit the World Trade Center, uh, racing to my armory, trying to get, you know, into a place to do something to make a positive contribution. I was in the National Guard at the time in a unit in Manhattan, uh, spending the day in frustration and shock combined, and finally deploying down to uh, to secure the perimeter around Ground Zero that night and working down there for the next couple of weeks. Uh, went from, you know, from shock to anger to just kind of a prolonged frustration. Um, I was really excited, you know, when the war in Afghanistan started a couple of weeks later. I was very excited uh, when, you know, the war in Iraq started. I was a supporter of both of those at the beginning of both of those. Um, I knew uh, at the start of the war, we were called up, deployed into Manhattan again to pull security there during the first couple of weeks. I knew that we were probably going to get mobilized and sent into like an occupation force. And I was a supporter of it again until I, you know, until I got home and started to do some analysis and assessment of what happened with the information, the intelligence. And, you know, it took years for me to really come all the way around. I was still supporting it for the first couple of years. Uh, but again, when when the first of those those nieces, my goddaughter, turned 18, it was really a, a, like a, a bolt out of the blue that, that this war, people were still in, in harm's way in Iraq and at the time Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, that she and her, her cousin and her sisters could be deployed. And it just, it blew my mind. And I realized that we have to be a lot more careful um, when we put, American troops in harm's way. And when we take the kind of steps that might lead them to be in harm's way, really need to think through every step. We do. And of course, so many of us on the right, we come from, you know, knowing someone, loving someone or being that person who is serving the military or who has, you know, I remember when my brother signed up for the Marine Corps uh, and how afraid I was because, you know, my, my great grandmother who, uh, you know, I, I really love, she passed away just a few years ago. One thing is that her dad died when she was quite young. And so one of her older brothers kind of took that fatherly role. Uh, he got drafted during World War II and unfortunately he did pass away. He was killed. Uh, his plane, he was a navigator in a B-17, I think. He was shot down over the Mediterranean. And I know how, how much that affected her life for, for the rest of her life, for the next 80 or so years. Uh, it was very, you know, it was very painful for her. It was very bittersweet, especially because World War II was talked about a lot. And she was one of those unlucky family members for whom her loved one was not coming home. But at least you could say he died for something and he knew in your mind exactly what that was and how, you know, we obtained mission, you know, mission accomplished for real. Then I think back to when my brother joins and then it seems like things are a lot more scattered. And I, one thing that always nagged at me was if he's deployed abroad and he's killed in some foreign fight, 
oftentimes if he's in Niger, like those uh, poor parents had to deal with a couple years ago with those uh, four who were killed, or if he's deployed out to any of these other nations and you think to yourself, well, if he's killed, what did he die for? Do we even know? A lot of times then the military doesn't really say because they go, oh, it's too classified. We can't, you know, explain. But it leaves a lot of us reeling. And I think, you know, that's where a lot of us have kind of felt in this lurch. So if you could perhaps, you know, for our audience kind of recap the kind of journey you had that many of us maybe had, you know, starting out in support of this because we support it for the right reasons. You know, we want to protect our nation, national security, and because we support our troops. What were some of the turning points for you, perhaps either when you were serving on the ground or, as you said, later in some of the work that you were doing that kind of moved the needle for you? Yeah, like I said, I, you know, serving at Ground Zero, I had already been a Marine. I was in the National Guard. I was very committed to defending my nation, and I felt personally attacked by the September 11th attacks. Uh, you know, I, it wasn't that I was silly enough to conflate Iraq and Afghanistan, but with the threat coming from Afghanistan and, and the war there, I believe the reported intelligence that there were weapons of mass destructions and that Saddam Hussein was a real threat. I also believe the narrative that it was important to keep stability in that region to control governments. And I went to war and there were things that, that happened in Iraq that I'm really proud of. Uh, I felt like I protected the the Shiite minority that lives in a community that we were in that was in the Sunni Triangle. Uh, I was part of the, the the team that helped investigate the the crimes of Saddam Hussein that led to that actually led to his prosecution. So there were things that happened that were good. But you start to, especially your second time around the, the block in a third world developing nation or in a developing nation. I had been in Somalia previously. You start to see the corruption, the, 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 the different culture. Not that it's bad, but it's not Western culture. They don't have the same rules of order. They don't have the same kind of um, expectations that we do. You start to see that we're struggling against all that. And just because of the personal connections I made with some of the, the young men and women, I still had hope for them for a year or two or three. But but I went back to, to war with Afghanistan in 2008 and came home from that. And, and just slowly over time, I, you know, I had been a realist as a student of international relations. I started to read deeper into what the people I read in college were saying about the current conflicts. My my nieces and my nephew got older and it just didn't it started to not make sense anymore. And it started to, to make sense what, what people that I hadn't listened to for years were saying about, you know, why are we risking young men and women? for things that aren't in America's core national interest. Is it really that important, as, as one of my friends put it, you know, which um, theocratic government is in charge in which part of the Middle East? And at the end of the day, we need to think about the Middle East as a region that isn't super vital to America's security. Not that we shouldn't care about it all, but we need to put it we need to put it in perspective. We need to put it in priority. We have bigger places, places where we need to be much more involved, you know, the situation has changed since the initial Iraq war back in the 90s with the way America has handles its energy situation here at home with other, you know, other energy sources throughout the world have been developed. And we just need to start treating Iraq like like a regular country. I've come to that conclusion. There are about twenty five hundred troops left in Iraq, and I'd like to see them come home as soon as possible. Uh, we're pushing. You know, Congress has uh, has some things going on uh, this weekend. There was a, a vote, a closure vote in the Senate for uh, Senate resolution to repeal the authorization for use of military force in Iraq that passed closure today. Um, it's coming up for a vote next week. You know, great hopes that that passes, uh, even if it doesn't really do anything practically for those 2,500 troops. It sends a signal that there are a lot of people in the American government who think that it's time to call an end to this. It sends a signal to those of us who serve there that that there are people who believe that as well. And, you know, it it, it puts at least kind of a period on it in the history book a little bit. It does. And, you know, you have these, you know, young men, young women who are, you know, re ready, willing and able to sacrifice themselves for the safety and security of their nation. And that is such a, a beautiful gift. And I don't think it's given the proper recognition by those in D.C. that it deserves. And they kind of use that to take advantage of these young men and women and say, well, oh, isn't that what you signed up for? Didn't you sign up to go die? No, they didn't actually sign up to go die. They're just willing to do so if it becomes necessary in the last line of defense. But I think that's taken way too much for granted. A lot of these wars, unfortunately, you look into it, a lot of politics plays into it. So we send our young men and women down. They don't fully know why they're there. They'll, they're only told uh, a small sliver of it. And then oftentimes they're forced to fight with basically one hand tied behind their back, take the full brunt of the cost. And then, you know, if, some, if something goes south politically, now they're pulled down. They're thinking, well, then what was all that blood? for? Why did my brothers in arms have to die? What's going on here? And that's what I don't like. I don't think that they're 
that Uncle Sam is taking it uh, as seriously as he should. And that's one thing that does bother me uh, when our troops are used as pawns. Uh, you know, like I said, it's a very special gift and it, it weakens us. We're not able to extend power abroad in areas where we need to when we're all over the place, when we're stretching ourselves way too thin, hemorrhaging in blood and treasure. So I'd like to ask, as you touched on, we still have troops left over in Iraq. Uh, you know, a lot of that has to do with ISIS, fighting ISIS. And then I believe over $2 trillion have been sunk into the war uh, or fighting in Iraq, I guess I should say. And yet, you know, you, f- you see veterans sometimes, you know, sickly with cancer, having to go to Congress every couple of years to beg for some help through the VA uh, for, you know, issues concerning 9-11 that they're dealing with, breathing in some of the, the, the air there or the burn pits. They're not treated very well. So before I let you go, tonight, I know that's a, a big focus for you is the VA. Uh, I know you said with the troops, you know, there's some movement there. Is there movement on the VA and bettering that care for our veterans? Well, you, you touch on a topic that's obviously near and dear to my personal heart. It's a big part of what we do at Concerned Veterans for America, cv4a.org on the web, cv4a.org. Uh, we, we, we think that the, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, particularly the Veterans Health Administration within it, has a lot of work to do. Uh, there are people who love using VA healthcare. There are some things that about VA healthcare that are very good, but it's very, very hard for especially for rural vets and vets who don't live close to to VA facilities to get that care. Uh, You know, there are vets who have to drive, you know, talking about the aftermath of war and, 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 you know, veteran suicide, veterans mental health. There are vets who have to drive for hours to access treatment. And, and, you know, I know three of my three of my friends that I serve with overseas have taken their own lives. I know that, you know, the the cost in 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 lives taken by by veterans themselves um, more than triples the cost of lives that actually were lost in Afghanistan and Iraq. So at Concerned Veterans for America, we're looking for the VA to, to you know, follow the law that was written in the Mission Act to, to refer veterans into community care when it makes sense for veterans. And we think that, you know, that there's opportunity to work through Congress to, to get the VA to follow that law and to, to reinforce it with some other laws and rules. And we're, we're pursuing that very, very hard because you're right. You know, when young men and women sign up with a promise for their lives, it's it's on America to take care of those people in a way that makes sense to those veterans living where they do, not to the big bureaucracy where they'd like to do it. You're exactly right, John. Of course, I love the work that you do. I really appreciate everything that you do. And of course, your service abroad. You know, of course, when we talk about some of the follies in foreign interventionism, we shouldn't forget, as you're saying, the sacrifices and the real good work that did come by the the men and women, the boots on the ground, put in those situations. You know, as I said, you know, the the rules of engagement, everything else kind of hands tied behind their back, but they make the best of it, fighting some very nasty forces abroad. And of course, they still, you know, uh, did good, kept their back straight and, you know, did America proud, even when the suits in D.C. weren't acting so great. But, you know, again, I don't think that should get lost when we talk about the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, the good that did come out of that, the good that men like you did. So, John, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. And I I agree with you. I appreciate all the work that my brothers and sisters have done for the last two decades.